seriously, Cy, what's your deal, man? Because I know you got them dope rhymes in the notepad. It's different when I'm writing songs by myself. I can't do all that up on the stage and everyone's watching me. All you need to do is get your flow tight, get some new fat gear, hit the gym a little bit, and if you put some zit cream on that forehead, you will be straight, dude. His life was all about the music. I know I'm ready and able, but I'm stuck here busting all these tables. Seems as if Urkel thinks he's a pretty clever rapper. I'm disappointed. You will not set foot in that club again. But you understand, I'm a songwriter. Any rap is inappropriate as far as I'm concerned. But a chance at stardom. One amateur artist will get their song produced by my record label. I'm gonna submit a song for the contest. Leads to a big misunderstanding. He's cute. Looks like we do have ourselves a winner. How's it feel to be rap's next superstar? He calls himself Truth. Truth. Who in the heck is Truth? That's me, I'm Truth. They made a mistake. No. You gotta think of something, man, please. She likes you because she thinks you're true, so why don't we just keep letting her think that? All of his dreams will come true for someone else. I had my part in this and now I'm starting to regret it. Listen, you need to chill out. Disney Channel presents... You just gotta speak up for yourself. You freeze up when it's time for you to get up on that stage, and then you get tongue-tied when it comes to telling Roxy how you feel. It seems like we have more in common than Chris and I. Tyler James Williams, Trevor Jackson, Coco Jones, and Brandon Michael Smith. It's about the music, it's what I'm good at. Maybe it's time you turned on the mic. This summer, the truth is in the music. Let It Shine, the Disney Channel original movie, premieres Friday, June 15th at 8, 7 central on Disney Channel. Find your dreams come true And I wonder if you know what it means to find your dreams DCOMs are, or were, the best thing about Disney Channel, surfing up instant classics like High School Musical, Cadet Kelly, Minutemen, Cheetah Girls, and Full Court Miracle. Hey coach, part of mine. Let's see. Oh. You the butt, baby. Huh? But then there are some that are underrated and underappreciated, lost in the background, like going to the mat. I'm serious, y'all slept on this movie. It was about a blind kid who could wrestle and it was amazing. But that's not what we're talking about today. Let It Shine was a decom from 2012, starring Tyler James Williams and Coco Jones. When it aired, it became the most watched decom of that year. This isn't surprising, not only because Let It Shine is a great movie, but the competition was Frenemies, Girl vs. Monster, and Radio Rebel. Though Let It Shine gets his fair share of praise, I can't help but notice how often it gets left behind. So sit back and let me and Gene tell you why Let It Shine is the greatest decom ever made. Yeah, so there was like no way that I was not gonna be part of this video. Between me and Ghost, our love for Let It Shine has always been kind of like a running joke. It's a decom, obviously, so the corniness is there for sure. Some of the writing is awkward and stilted at certain points. We both did like a little bit of acting as kids, so we know what it feels like to deliver lines written by an old person trying to relate to you. The wardrobe is something straight out of like an old Navy back to school ad. Better yet, it's like uh, those McDonald's, like let's try to relate to the black community commercials where they're all like wearing fedoras and you know, two collared shirts and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's that. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Although, although, I did think Cyrus was pretty fresh with his little church fits, I'm not gonna lie. And of course, there's the whole, like, my dad doesn't understand me plot line and everything like that. It's a decom. So I remember seeing this movie when I was 15 and it was premiering that night. It was a Disney Channel premiere. You remember those nights. It was kind of lit because we were all around and like, I'd heard about this new rap movie that was coming out on Disney Channel. I saw Chris from Everybody Hates Chris and I'm like, oh my God, that's Chris. That show was like the wonder years for me. So I kind of already grew up with Tyler James Williams and Dude, from the jump, he's a church kid who's a rapper, me. His dad is a preacher, me. He has a best friend who all the girls love, me. He's shy, he has super duper stage fright, me. And his dad doesn't really, really like his music all that much, me. It's scary how much is Taylor made for me. The movie starts as most hood classics do, in church, it's here where we meet the church choir, being directed by our lead, Cyrus. This song slaps. It's one of the many bangers in this movie. And for those of you with a keen eye, yes, that is Chloe and Halle Bailey. Don't get too excited. They're barely in the movie. 
these are definitely Sunday morning youth outfits. Super bright and conservative, you know, girls, they're wearing skirts, but it's leggings and flats and they're all pastel colors, cardigans, fedoras, undone ties. And it definitely is like a multicultural choir, quote unquote, because you got the two white choir members who are also keeping up with the choreography. So come through Natalie and Austin. Also, it's 2012 because that Dougie was sturdy. <laughs> My man's Dougie was on point. Hey, hey, hey. Also, did Chris write, produce, and arrange this whole song? Ain't this nigga like 16? That's hella impressive. I bet he choreographed the dances too. After service, Cyrus gets scolded by his father, the pastor of the church, calling the performance nonsense and embarrassing, believing all rap and hip hop is the devil's music and doesn't belong in a house of worship. It's crazy though, that pastor trips when the music drops. It's not even hip hoppy. Like when the music drops, like at the beginning, it's a gospel song. It's just upbeat. Like, what did he want it to be? He want everything to be slow? They don't have praise and worship in this church? How did his dad not see the potential in having a youth choir this good? All the contests they could have won? This easily could have been Sister Ad 3 if you weren't so uptight. That night, we see Cyrus sneaking out of the house to meet up with his friend, Chris, the worst person in the movie. He passes off some new beats to Chris on a CD for some reason. You couldn't have given him a flash drive? Next, we have an impromptu rap battle, which is how we get introduced to the main antagonist of the movie, Lord of the Blue. After the battle, we get this random stare down for some reason. They don't even know each other. I don't think they've ever met before. We meet back up with Cyrus as he accidentally spills water on Blaine. New shoes, stupid. Lucky you didn't do all I was spitting my hot rocks. You got some basic skill, I'll give you that, but you know that with the rhymes. Oh shit. Why did Cyrus even say anything if he wasn't gonna back it up? I mean, I don't mean to be on Bling's side here, but Cyrus, you brought this on yourself. There's a deleted scene where Cyrus actually raps back and kind of embarrasses him in front of his crew. And only after that does he go on stage to call him out. I wish they kept this in the original. It helped add to their rivalry. Back at the house, we see Cyrus and Chris watching an interview with their childhood friend, Roxy, played by the queen, Coco Jones. She's one of the best things about this movie. She announces a contest where artists can submit a song for a chance to get it produced by her label and star in a music video. I'm gonna submit a song for the contest. For real? Yeah. I'm gonna win it. <laughs> I don't know about all that. Why you say that? Cause I'm doing a song for the contest too. Nigga, why? You've never shown any interest in rap or music. You just dance. Now, because Chris wants to enter the contest, all of a sudden you're a rapper now? That's weird. It's like he's doing it at a spike. He can't let Cyrus just have his moment, especially since you know he's leagues better than you. You just said outside that he's great with the pen and you got the gall to think you're on the same level? This nigga, I swear to God. The whole thing that started this movie was this stupid photo, which doesn't make sense to me because it's like, does Cyrus not have any solo pictures of himself? Like, why did he send in a picture of him and Chris? Maybe it was so she would recognize him? <gasps> Whoa, okay, I just had a revelation. Cyrus? is so not confident that Roxy will remember him that he puts a picture of Chris in there as well. We've been talking about this for years. Why do you put the picture of both of them in there? It's because he didn't think that Roxy would remember him. And he was like, hey, here's Chris. I know you remember Chris at least. Yo, that's crazy. This movie is actually genius. Genius writing. So his dad is doing one of those, this is what's wrong with kids nowadays sermons. And not only is it mildly triggering, but for someone who hates rap, you talk about it a lot. We gotta come together as a community and eliminate the harmful influences of hip hop and end the powerful grip it's got on our children. You men gotta stop being gangsters and start being graduates. Oh, Man, boo. Tomato, tomato, tomato. You're not really from the church if you've never sat through a Young People Today sermon. Young People Today with they with they pants and they music and they this, that. Like if you never sat through like a Footloose sermon, then I don't think you really know God. <laughs> Fast forwarding a little, we're back in the club where they announced the winner of the rap contest. And it's here where the central conflict starts. We're back with the Disney Channel movie. They go up to Chris saying he's the winner of the contest, but when they announce his rap name, they call him Truth, the name that Cyrus used. 
I'm, I'm cool, Chris. Who in the heck is true? That's me. I'm true. What? I'm not sure how this even happens, to be honest, because both Cyrus and Chris submitted a tape, and I assume Chris submitted his with his own picture. So, did Roxy ever get Chris's tape? Or was Cyrus's submission so good that she just stopped looking? The whole situation could have been handled better, with Cyrus not standing up for himself and Roxy dismissing Cyrus for being truth. But I still blame Chris. He knew Cyrus was never gonna speak up and took advantage of that and he sees in his face that it bothers him. But he just don't care. Mind you, he wasn't saying all this when he found out he lost, but once he got outside with the cameras and shit, that's when he wanted to flip the script. And I hate that he puts it on Cyrus, making it seem like that they both have something to gain from this. Homie didn't even try to work it out himself. Chris is the real villain of this movie. Another amazing moment in this movie that's not funny but it should be is when Cyrus sees Chris and Roxy taking pictures outside. When he tells Levi that Chris is about to tell Roxy that he's actually truth. He walks outside, sees them taking pictures, and his smile is actually not funny, but it's hilarious. <laughs> On that point, Chris and Roxy are both tripping. They're tripping super hard. For one, she's moving way too fast to be kissing him on the cheek like that on camera, like establishing a relationship in the zeitgeist immediately like that. That's crazy. Number two, they could have easily still dated while Chris telling her that Cyrus is actually truth. Like, come on, yo, like real friends. How many of us? And to be honest, number three, Cyrus is dumb for giving Chris the idea to remain truth. Like Cyrus could have easily been like, heck no, Roxy, we can, I can bring my laptop and show you the files. The next day, we meet back up with them at the studio, where Cyrus tries to teach Chris how to rap in less than 10 minutes. Yo, I'm about to rap. I like cats. You like cats? Get money. Jump higher than a bunny. I'm getting money. It's gonna be a no for me, dog. Keep it up, though. Yo, if this was your attempt at a freestyle, I can't even imagine what your tape sounded like. They're eventually found by Lila, and she takes them up to the studio. Lila is also an underrated character in this movie. When Chris and Cyrus are on the way to the studio in the elevator, and she says, your suspenders all dangling, I was like, you took the words right out of my mouth, because this man is dressed crazy. Look how many colors he has on. There's no scheme. He just put on hella clothes. It's like he's trying to, you ever seen somebody try to like steal from a store by putting on the clothes? This little short sleeve collared shirt over a long sleeve collared shirt with a fedora combo, ain't it, Chris? In the studio, Cyrus offers his assistance since their dedicated engineer is late. It's a nice moment. You get the sense that he's coming full circle from working at his home studio. Look how determined they are to keep the slide going. Got Chris doing lip sync battles with Cyrus. Soon after, Roxy shows up and they manage to switch places before she notices, somehow. The next day, we catch Cyrus in the studio working on a new song and Roxy stops by to watch the process. Soon after, Lila shows up, saying that Roxy's gonna headline the upcoming Rap Grand Slam. She's nervous at first, feeling like she doesn't deserve it, but Cyrus reassures her that she's more than worthy. In the next scene, we meet up with Levi, where Chris laments about his troubles. Levi might be one of my favorite characters, not just because he acts as a mentor and low-key a second dad, but because he's one of the few people in the movie to tell him how ridiculous this plan is. I can't believe they haven't got caught yet. He also delivers one of my favorite lines in the movie. This is a perfect match for Roxy. Hey, that's not true. You just gotta speak up for yourself and be who you really are. Who am I really? Your truth. Oh, yeah, and truth is a bad cat. I'm not gonna lie, the Cyrus Levi scene had me in shambles as a kid. Still watch it to this day, get a little choked up. I'm a sap for little be yourself monologues. Yeah, nah, this was. It was pretty well done, and the score going into Guardian Angel, just peak. All right, so here comes one of, if not the dumbest part of the movie. All right, bear with me. So after his talk with Levi, Chris decides to put on one of his tracks and starts rapping. That's completely fair. He's had a long week. Homie just wanted to vibe out. As this is happening, Roxy pulls up. She was supposed to meet up with Chris, but he flaked. Then, all of a sudden, homie starts getting really into it. I mean, he starts doing the Drake hands and everything. Roxy hears the music from the outside and goes in to investigate. And she walks in on Cyrus rapping on stage as clear as day. Cyrus? Roxy, what are you doing here? I came to meet Chris, you were just rapping. Caught in the act, he makes up a lie, claiming that he wasn't rapping. 
he was lip singing and she believes him. Hey, I was, this mic's not even on. See, I was just lip syncing. Wow. You might just be the best lip syncer I've ever seen. Come the fuck on now, bruh. So you're telling me you saw this man literally rapping in real life, but he gaslit you enough to deny what you saw with your own eyes? Like what? Are you dumb? Bitch, are you dumb? But back to the story. Since Chris is nowhere to be found, Cyrus offers to take her out. She says yes, and they pretty much spend the whole day together. It was a nice moment. They have a walk, get some food, even stumble upon a rap battle. And once again, during these battles, the extras are doing a lot in the background. You can tell whenever the director said, act surprised. So everybody reacts at the same time. Something happens, everybody reacts at the same time. That's not how the real world works. The next day, we're back at church and Roxy shows up. The crowd seems to be very happy about her return, but the pastor isn't having any of that shit. He dedicates his entire sermon to Roxy being a heathen. You, you, you can't dance like a vixen and then ask God to do the fixing. God knows who does their living in hypocrisy. Or should I say hip hop? <laughs> and this is how church hurt starts. Also, look at all the first ladies in their Sunday hats. The next day, we meet back up with Chris getting ready for the music video. We discover that Roxy won't be performing alone. She'll be doing a duet with Truth. As a result, Chris would have to perform live rather than lip syncing. Cyrus tries to tell him how this is bad for them, but all Chris seems to care about is the amount of girls he can add to his harem. Then out of nowhere, Cyrus's dad shows up. He apologizes to Roxy about what he said in church the other day. Not only was this unexpected, but it was nice to see him right as wrong. But the moment is immediately ruined when he finds out that Cyrus works here. He makes a scene talking about how embarrassing this makes him look while demanding that Cyrus come home. Then we have this legendary moment where Cyrus finally stands up to his dad. No. Oh my God. <laughs> what would have been more legendary is if he got a whipping right there. <laughs> Breathe, bro, breathe. Back at the house, Cyrus tries to explain himself, but his dad doesn't care. He tells him that he's banned from going back to the club and he's grounded for the rest of the summer. Next, we have a montage of basically life passing him by. Chris becomes famous, he's on TV getting interviewed, and his song is becoming number one on the Sharp charts, beating out Shy's My Time and Showbiz Lucky Day, which is kind of crazy. Showbiz got me through high school. Lucky Day was a bop. This is weird. Why does Cyrus have a sticker of his dad in his notebook? And did he make that? Did he go to Vistaprint? After the montage, Roxy stops by the vent and they go for a walk. Another thing in this movie that's like slightly annoying to me is how they treat Roxy's star power. So in one moment, she's walking into the club and everybody's cheering and stuff. In the other moment, she's out walking with Cyrus. Like she's supposed to be this big star and nobody's paying attention. On the flip, Chris becomes truth and his song goes number one. He's out on the street and he's getting mobbed by girls. Make it make sense. She talks about how her and Chris don't seem to be working out. You could say it's like he's a whole nother person. She wishes they could connect in the same way she and Cyrus do. Amidst their walk, they stumble upon a record store and bond over their love of music. Cyrus tells her that with her voice, she can sing anything. She doesn't have to be bound by the trendy pop stuff. She appreciates the encouragement and they almost have a moment. Later that night, Cyrus swung by the club to find Chris. He confronts him about how he's been treating Roxy. Chris gets defensive and has the audacity to say that this is all his fault. Nigga, this was your idea. They get into a fight and Levi breaks it up. Cyrus leaves, telling Chris he's on his own, as he should. Real quick, this confused the hell out of me when I first saw it. In the shot where he comes back to the house, where did he come from? Like dead ass, he just appears. Did he come from the window? Homie walked in like he was Batman. The next day, Cyrus meets back up with his dad and they talk about his music. After looking over his songbook, he realizes that though they are rap lyrics, the messages behind them were positive. He apologizes for judging them so harshly and they embrace having a new understanding of each other. Me and my dad, we did have a similar I like your songs conversation. It was pretty nice. It was pretty nice. It was like, I released some songs, like in like a little pack. And uh, my dad heard it. It might've been the same year that we had our big argument. I remember I was going to school and he stopped me and he was like, hey man, I heard your songs. Like, I liked them. And I'm not trying to make assumptions, but I could kind of tell that he was nervous to do it because of the history that we had with these songs uh, or with my music period. It meant a lot to me to hear him say that he actually liked it. Yeah, great moment. <laughs>
It's the night of the Grand Slam, and without Cyrus in his corner, Chris is losing it. But that doesn't last long. Cyrus shows up to bail him out. Chris gives this whack-ass apology, and they make up. And then Bling shows up to be a menace, and delivers my favorite line of the whole movie. <laughs> well, listen up, Poindexter. Ah! Got he! In the next scene, it's showtime. Roxy comes out to perform her song, opting to embrace her church roots rather than all the wigs and platform shoes. Now, in hindsight, this was hella dumb because instead of telling her he's truth in the back, he tells her on stage in front of the entire crowd through a song, no less. I know you're gonna be mad. Feelings that you thought you had was for another guy. Well, I'm that other guy. And you know what makes this whole scene funny is that even though she's very upset, she commits to the song. Imagine watching this live in the crowd. I'd be so confused. Also, look at the shot at Chris. Thick ass sad nigga. After the song, she runs back to her dressing room. The guys try to console her until... Come on, open up. I'm sorry, but we were electric out there. Couldn't you feel it? Damn, nigga. <laughs> Roxy hit him like... <laughs> Cyrus tries to explain himself, saying that he felt that she would have never accepted him the way he was. But she claps back saying his looks were never a factor. His words is what she fell in love with. You sure about that? That's deep and all, but kind of bullshit. You barely acknowledged him when you met him. And you didn't think twice about Cyrus possibly being true. They were both on that picture. While this is all happening, there was a whole rap battle on stage between Bling and Revelation. A battle I would have loved to see, not gonna lie. Bling is announced the winner, and Truth gets the honor to present the trophy. Bling doesn't seem phased that Cyrus is Truth and still calls him out his name. Cyrus says he doesn't deserve this trophy saying he isn't the best in Atlanta or even the best in the building. And it's here where we get the best part of the movie, the final battle, a moment of truth. This is by far my favorite part of the movie. The only thing I don't like about it is this last bar from Cyrus. You don't have the guts to tell us who you really are. So you can keep a trophy that you don't deserve. I might be a bus boy, but you just got served. <laughs> Bullshit. The next day, we're back at church. Chris shows up because Lauren knows he needs some prayer. And soon after, Roxy shows up, forgiving them all for playing her like a fool. And the movie ends with Cyrus taking center stage, embracing his talents, and letting them shine. Don't go away. We'll be back with a Disney Channel movie. We're back with a Disney Channel movie. This movie was very well cast. Quinny B. Vance is an amazing catch for a movie like this. He's a top tier actor in my opinion. Levi is amazing in this. Look at the top of his head! The dude from Drumline is in this <laughs> as the host of the Rap Grand Slam. Cyrus is my favorite character. While he could be shy and diffident, his journey to find his voice was inspiring. One of the reasons I think it worked so well was that we saw it happening in real time, slowly affecting him. Every side, side glance or forced smile, we see it slowly getting to him. Though some of Tyler's expressions throughout the movie low-key ruin some of his scenes. Like I know he's trying to portray anger and frustration, but it just comes across as goofy to me. I can't help but laugh. Homie oh, just a funny looking nigga. <laughs> That episode of Abbott where he was in a do-rag, I legit laughed for like five minutes. Tyler James Williams, like I said, great actor. I think we're seeing him finally come into like his his moment with Abbott. You know, he's really getting his recognition. He's not little dude from across the street no more. So he's definitely great as like this awkward, blank character on the outside with a lot of passion on the inside. It's crazy though to see Tyler James Williams in this. I think the big reason why I connect with this movie so much is because I loved Everybody Hates Chris as a kid. So I already grew up kind of relating to Chris. And now, you know, a few years later when I discover music, I'm relating to Cyrus with the same person depicting the two. Did y'all know, I think it was 2015, Tyler James Williams and his brother, his little brother dropped a mixtape Hold on, let me go. Hold on, let me look this up. Me, my brother, and a mic. It is uh, not great. It's not great in my opinion. I guess it was cute for its time, but it has since been deleted. I can't find it anywhere on SoundCloud. Speaking of his real rapping in the real world, his sway freestyles, I went back and listened to a couple of them for this video. They're not horrible. Like, he can actually, like, when it comes to freestyles, he can actually freestyle. He went on Sway twice. I think he went once in 2015, and that one was actually pretty cool. And then he did one some months ago over a Glorilla beat, and I wasn't really feeling it. A lot of ladies love it, 
because he has this great deep voice, but I thought it was a little, it was a little corn, but he's a little corn, so it's whatever. He kind of raps like Childish Gambino, like with the same precise vernacular and precise vocabulary. He'll just be saying like random stuff and you're like, why'd he come up with that word? But I appreciate it for what it is. I think Chris was cast perfectly with Trevor Jackson because he's very exciting on the outside, but not a whole lot on the inside. You know what I'm saying? Like Trevor Jackson is supposed to be this attractive guy, perfect Jackson 5 afro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like light skin, can dance, nice smile. He's just like, he's basically like Cyrus 2.0. Trevor Jackson did good work. He has a natural charisma that works for the character. And while I do hate Chris and everything he stands for, he was enjoyable to watch. His moments of just being an obnoxious prick were kind of funny. Though he was living a lie, he was walking around like he really was true. I mean, that is some peak narcissism. Coco Jones, I've always said Coco Jones is amazingly talented. She's beautiful, definitely had a crush on her coming up. I think it's cool that they made her this star that is just kind of looking for her voice. And she tries to find it, I believe, in Chris. Like she sees Chris, she hears this song that Cyrus actually wrote, but it was Chris's face. So her, in her mind, it's like, oh my gosh, this is perfect, this fairy tale. You know, especially as, you know, she's this big superstar. So she's like, man, this feels so real, it, you know, it's personal. So I feel like because of that, she expects so, so, so much from Chris. Like in the in the booth when she was like, just uh, freestyle, speak from your heart. And it's like, bro, like, okay, chill. Like he's ch like, come on, it takes like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like she's like, make it all deep and make it this and make it that. You, you can tell that she's young. Like I'm trying to give this movie credit <laughs> because I like it so much. You can tell that she's just kind of like searching for something real. She believes she found it in Chris. And um, you can tell how heartbroken she is when, you know, the truth is revealed. You know, one note I do want to make, Roxy is so selfish to think that Don't Run Away was written about her. When she comes to off the street to visit Cyrus and Chris, she says, hey, Chris, I think it was written about me. And it's just like, bro, like, how do you just assume that? Like, Chris could have a whole girlfriend out here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And you wouldn't even know, but you're just like, I think it was written about me. Like, that'd be crazy if I ran up to, to Beyonce and was like, I think... I think Drunken Love was written about me. <laughs> it just seems weird and selfish to kind of to kind of just insinuate that and put that pressure on him. She's a great representation of the church singer to R&B singer transition that happens a lot in the actual world. That's been a big criticism about R&B singers when it comes to the church, quote unquote, selling their souls. I love the, the commentary that this movie provides through Roxy's character about that conversation. Like, I don't want to get too deep up in here. I'm just saying that's what it feels like to me. And I didn't really even notice that until this last rewatch. The fact that Roxy never caught them or even felt that something was off is bonkers. There was a scene where Cyrus was literally feeding Chris his rhymes and she didn't hear it. You didn't find it odd that Chris needed to pause every other line. Even when they're on stage and he reveals himself as truth, it all should have just clicked. I think it's crazy that she genuinely had no idea. But anyway, Coco Jones did a great job as Roxy and low key might have had the best performance out of the three. It wasn't anything spectacular. She just gave a very genuine performance. She gave off the vibe as a first time pop star and the stress that comes with that. It was almost like she was on her own journey to find her voice. Second to Cyrus, Bling is my favorite. Brandon Michael Smith bodies this performance. He was made for this role. I'm surprised he never got his own show. Like imagine a Bling spinoff, that would be amazing. Especially since he technically won the final battle. I mean, let's talk about it. Bling had better rhymes, delivery, flow, cadence. Bling bodied Cyrus. And if it wasn't for plot armor, Cyrus would have lost. Brandon Michael Smith, he's so talented. I think if you watch So Random, Sunday with a Chance, anything else that he's been in, bro, he is an amazing talent, an amazing actor. I don't know what happened in his life to make him kind of like fall off so much. I think he deserves kind of a second chance too. He's great as Bling. He's just this, you know, really braggadocious guy. He reminds me a lot of like B.O.B. Uh, in a sense, because B.O.B. to me had this like meteoric rise and then like just crash landed. I think one of the unsung heroes of this movie is Cyrus's mom. She does provide a great few comedic moments and just some levity in Cyrus's life. I love how she plays the dual role of a parent to Cyrus, yes, but she also supports him in his dream and lets him spread his wings, as well as her husband, corrects him when he's wrong, but also supports him whenever it comes to actually disciplining Cyrus. Here's what's wrong with music today. I gotta practice what I preach, otherwise I look like a fool in my own church. Honey, you look like a fool anyway. I think that's a really dope example of black parenting in a movie, as well as Christian parenting in a movie. So just in terms of like tropes and like styles, I think they kind of gave 
each one of the musical characters, I'll say their own little like parallel in the music world. Cyrus is common. Roxy's like Nicki Minaj. Chris is Chris Brown. And Bling is like, I'd say that Bling is the closest thing to the game. Like, <laughs> like somebody who's just antagonizing everybody. Phantom style is like Logic or any white rapper you can think of. Token, Eminem, g Easy, MGK, Maddie B, whoever. And Revelation is B.O.B. He looks like B.O.B. a little bit with the big glasses and everything. B.O.B. was huge at this point. Airplanes was taken off, no pun intended. Also, is Revelation Christian? Because Revelation is a book in the... Anyway, too deep, too deep. Never mind. Don't go away. There's lots more coming your way. And now, back to the show. The best part of mini decoms is the music, and Let It Shine is no exception. It has one of the best soundtracks of any decom. I mean, they got Coco Jones on it. Like, they already won the game. And I'm not ashamed to say it, there's a lot of songs on here that I still bump to, to this day. day. Joyful Noise is definitely one of my favorites. And I think it sets the tone for the whole movie very well. When you think back on other decom musicals, a lot of them kind of blend together, but Joyful Noise stands on its own. I would argue that it has the best intro out of all the DCOMs, second to maybe High School Musical 2. For it being Disney's first time doing anything gospel, they did pretty good. In this song, we also learn a lot about Cyrus. We get a glimpse into his relationship with his dad. We get to see his love for music while also establishing his role in the church. I also like the little detail where in Joyful Noise, we see him off to the side in the background. But by the end of the movie, he's standing center stage. It was a nice touch. But yeah, Joyful Noise is a solid song. Don't Run Away has no right being this good. Like Deadass, this is mainstream ready. It has a dope beat behind it. The rhymes are simple but catchy. It sounds like this would have worked in the real world, if that makes sense. Like, if a kid made this song in his bedroom, put it on Spotify, or entered it in the contest, I could see it blowing up. I feel like I bumped Joyful Noise a bit more, but it's still a good song. You Belong To Me is not good. It's so corny. It's so bad and corny. <laughs> the beat is terrible. It sounds like a kid's bop beat. You know what I mean? Like, it sounds like something I could have made with like Magic Music Maker. If for whatever reason I decided to go frolicking in a field of flowers, oh this is the beat that would accompany me. And the rhymes are bad too. Homie said, I've been looking for the one, you've been looking for a dime. Maybe we can both find it at the same time. Nigga, shut the fuck up, boy. There's nothing good about this song. There's something redeeming about this song. This is a terrible song. You Belong With Me, I like a lot, but I find myself going back to the scene rather than going back to Spotify listening to the actual track. I feel like it works better as a song in scene. Like you can't fully enjoy it without already having seen the movie. Guardian Angel is definitely an underrated song in this movie, which is wild because this is definitely in my top three. The beat is dope, great chorus, and Tyler delivers some of his best rhymes in the whole movie. Good To Be Home is another song I really like. I think it's Coco Jones' best performance in the entire soundtrack. It sounds like something I would have heard on the radio somewhere. Like I feel like it exists outside of the movie. Probably would have got covered by Hillsong or some shit. It was also a nice character moment for Roxy. In the beginning, you kind of see her nervous and timid to perform since it's been so long since she sung at the church but by the time she got to the midway point to the last chorus she fully embraces the song literally feeling so good to be home who i'm gonna be is a very forgettable song like dead ass i forgot it existed on its own but it wasn't until i had to do this section of the video that i was reminded that it existed I didn't even acknowledge it in the movie. It's an okay song. There are works on the track, but like there's nothing unique about it that makes it replayable. Honestly, you could skip this. <laughs> Shit, I did. Moment of Truth is another song I feel works better in context than just a one-off song. In context, this is a very good song. It's very powerful, it has a lot of meaning and depth to it. But just as a part of an album, as a part of a soundtrack, it's okay. The best part of the songs are Bling's verses. He bodies Cyrus. The only bar he had was the taxi cab, which doesn't really work when you think about the context of the movie. No one else saw Bling getting out that cab. And his last bar, I might be a busboy, but you just got served. Nigga, what? That doesn't work because like, 
You are a bus boy. That is your job in real life. We've seen you do it. This man's been punking you all summer and that's the best you got? See, nah, he better than me. I would have put that mic down, pull out the nine and- To be honest with you, Diane, I'm surprised. Let It Shine is a very fitting outro. Not just for the namesake, but I feel that it provides a very satisfying ending. Finally, Cyrus has this moment center stage doing what he loves. The only thing that ruins it is Cyrus himself. His voice is damn near insufferable on this track. At least the chorus is really good. And overall, the instrumental is very well done. If you could get past Cyrus yelling at you, this song is really good. All right, so I want to talk about the music real quick. I think one of the main concerns I had when this movie first came out was exactly how Disney Channel was going to handle the genre of hip hop. They don't have a great track record. You can look at even just Camp Rock, right? When Allison Stoner hit those two freaking keys on her keyboard out like she was making a beat or something. And then also when Joe Jonas was teaching that hip hop dance class, when it was really just like a pop dance class because everybody had to grab a mic and a fedora, like it's always been handled so poorly. If you were to have a rap in the Disney Channel original song it was either like just a side thing you know what I'm saying like you have a pop song with a with a white girl or guy running around and then you have you know Mitchell Musso or the dude from Lemonade Mouth come out and start doing a rap as like a oh look at this look at this cultural urban thing like oh it's exciting like it was just like the it was just always mishandled it was always a side thing or a punchline and I thought this movie was going to be full of that to my surprise it was kind of handled well I mean the songs aren't perfect or anything but when it comes to the genres of hip-hop R&B and gospel this movie does a great job with his music I can't even lie so the intro song Joyful noise. Great representation of gospel. It's actually on one of my playlists <laughs> that I listen to. Definitely the best song. The instrumentation and arrangement is on point from the gospel intro leading into the hip hop part. It's a full on gospel song, but the rap is handled really nicely and fits in there well. Mind you, Chloe and Hallie are also singing <laughs> as main vocals on this song, so how can you go wrong? Amazing. Joyful Noise, super dope. Don't Run Away is actually pretty straight. It's kind of like the main song of the movie, I guess. The lead single of the movie, if you will. It just has a great mix of things. The synth is really nice. It's really, you know, family friendly, so it's not too crazy. I will say, though, the worst bar of the movie is in this song. You're more than Mista. Ah, girl, you pterodactyl fly. That junk is horrible. But I do want to know, who's the guy who actually sang on the song? Because it is not Tyler James Williams. <laughs> not in the slightest. They had him rap stuff, and then they had this other guy sing. Like, it's definitely not him. Okay, so that's what I said. Roxy's first song. Pretty good. Not bad. Coco Jones. I think this is the first time a lot of people were introduced to her as an actor and as an artist. And so I think it does a good job of kind of showing off her range because you you know you see her rap this is honestly one of her best songs that's great in terms of presenting her as who she is like she's this big bubbly character she can actually sing dance showcases all her talents without shoehorning anybody in it's really one of the only solo songs in a movie and she carries it and the rap is actually pretty dope like following my swag like a shadow like it's you know it's definitely one of those Nicki Minaj Nicki Azaria type bars it definitely copies Nicki Minaj tropes of being like like doing that crazy voice I think it does good like for a Disney Channel song it's pretty and the beat is actually kind of dope i also wanted to judge the little like raps that went on in this so you have a, a little section of bling going in on roxy and cyrus now mind you i'm a huge battle rap fan and so <laughs> looking back on this movie it's definitely cringe you know what i'm saying because some of this stuff would not work in the actual battle rap world it's not me being a purist or anything like that i'm just saying but i will say he says he's the truth but i'm not a believer that was perfect that's definitely something hitman Hollywood would have said and it would have shook the room don demarco so at this point in the movie, You Belong To Me comes along, and it is the worst song by far. Lohi Cyrus sounds like Nav, <laughs> and this beat sounds like one of those pre-made beats on a Casio keyboard. Like, it's it's not really, it's supposed to be like the love song, you know, You Belong To Me, even those words really wouldn't fly in 2023. I'm a poet, I didn't even know it. But yeah, it's just, it's not bad, it's just, it's just, it, it is just. So the next song, Guardian Angel, it definitely brings a song quality average back up for me. I love the way the score fades into the song, especially after that emotional moment between Cyrus and Levi. It just works. It just works in the way that, you know, even the keys come in and then it, you know, leads into the, the synth coming in and then it just, you know, it drops and, and he starts rapping. It's, it's like really well-timed musicality. These are actually really good. Um, he's talking. <laughs> he's talking that talk on these songs. Also, the scenery is really nice. You got the stained glass windows kind of mirroring, you know, his 
his religious past. I like that. So Good To Be Home is pretty straight. It's like a really straightforward gospel song. And it's nice. You know what I'm saying? I think Coco Jones is definitely able to show some of her range. I like that commentary on like people leaving the church for the mainstream world, a la Whitney Houston or Taylor Swift, Katy Perry, Beyonce, Fantasia. I like, I like how they kind of brought it back to that. Really dope. Especially in the middle of the movie. It's like the beginning of the second act. I also love the thought that they cut one of the choir members solos for Roxy to sing instead. Like somebody had been practicing all week. It was like, okay, this Sunday I'm gonna get my big solo. And then Roxy, the multi-platinum superstar, decides to stop by and steal your spotlight. So the third Roxy song, or the third Coco Jones song, Who I'm Gonna Be, it's the worst song. It, it just, it sounds like a Disney Channel song. It, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about like Disney Channel trying to be black, Nigga. like trying to emulate black music. It definitely sounds like they tried to make an R&B song. It just don't sound good. It really don't sound good. And I mean, it's it's not horrible. It's just the worst song. So Me and You is actually pretty dope. I love the piano sample. The beginning, it's, it's really, as a rapper, it's one of those things that you could rap on without any drums. The fact that she sung along with him you know what you know what it shows me it shows me that she because she's all about chris being like oh he's such a good artist and all that stuff it's almost like she met her musical match you know what i'm saying like oh shoot he's freestyling with me okay so i'm i'm mad at you this could have worked but you could have been told me so i'm heartbroken but i'm gonna just instead of going off on you let's talk in our language which is music moment of truth oh it's not called battle it's called moment of truth my bad i will say we're going back to judging bars right bling won round one clearly like the snake without the rattle, you're the duck without the... Actually, those might be the worst bars in the movie. Nah, they're not worse than Terry Fly. I'll take that back. But um, they just weren't it. This fool couldn't rap anything but my burrito. Like, okay. okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, bet. But Bling was taught... What, what did Bling say? Here we go again. Prepare to meet your end. Just looked you up on Facebook. You have zero friends. This kid's a loser, yo. He never kissed a girl. You write a love letters about her ice and pearls. Like, that in itself isn't like crazy bars but it's definitely the bars you want to start off with like just attacking your opponent immediately just making them look small off rip you're not wasting any time you're not even going that crazy in terms of the bars you're not wasting your best bars it's all about getting the crowd involved like look at this guy especially he's going first come on now also that wise christian background dancer like an extra soul train was pretty dope uh so round one clearly to blink i want to talk about his second round though i really want to talk about his second round because this junk is almost like there are moments in battle rap where somebody is getting beat so bad the crowd says leave him alone leave him alone round two from bling would have easily gotten him a leave me alone chant kid you have to hold your mommy's hand before you cross the street you have to sneak out the house just to clean and sweep facts, facts. <laughs> these are facts he's exposing him and now you look queasy i made him go mute put your camera phones up you can post this on youtube truth's got a screw loose he's terrified to bust what nigga weird cuz so lightweight that i can blow him over with a gust you're weak like seven days eh. you deserve booze you should walk around in some high heel shoes okay those those aren't 2023 you're shaking in your boots are your feelings getting hurt well maybe i should hurt more than your feelings maybe i should rip the roof off the theater ceiling maybe you should start kneeling his eyes are getting misty you're so whack if you were me you couldn't diss me kissy kissy roxanne did you miss me i'll take you out to dinner after i've eaten this pip squeak and when we're on vacation i'll let him house sit here's a couple bucks buy yourself a better outfit bro that is so fire that is so <laughs> Leave him alone! Leave him alone! Leave him alone! Bro, that is so fire to me. Like, as a kid, when I was watching, he threw the money on him! Nigga! For one, I didn't know they could mention Facebook and YouTube and Soul Train in this movie. So the fact that Bling broke the Disney Channel copyright rules is amazing. So all Truth could do, Truth had to come with amazing round. You know what? You don't have a stack of cash or a flashy pad. I saw you last week driving a taxi cab. He did. Your secret's out, and now they know it, sport. We'll call if we need a ride to an airport. That's fire. <laughs> In fact, you can drop me off home after this. Then you can take a couple bucks back, but that's a tip. Taking his money back and throwing, because he, he is a taxi driver. I mean, those might have been his tips <laughs> for, the, for the week. You're playing yourself like Salah's hair, telling everyone to hear this, you're a millionaire. You're not a baller, you're a phony. I bet your whole crew is a bunch of rena homies. And now you lie in bed lonely, your persona's a facade. The only girls you get are in the pages of a catalog. I don't know if that's like a masturbation joke. He said, you lie in bed lonely? And the only girls you get are in the catalog? Here stands Lord of the Bluff. His lies were legendary, so the truth made him hush. And what's funny is your truth is enough. 
why'd you have to make up all the money and the stuff he's talking to his soul like after you kind of kill somebody you say bro you didn't have to do all that like low-key like sunning him i guess it's easier to play the role and act hard because you don't have the guts to tell us who you really are so you can keep a trophy that you don't deserve i might be a bus boy but you just got served that's hard, bro. When you read these lyrics without the beat, because the beat's low-key whack. When you read these lyrics without the beat, they kind of go in. And you got to stay with the conviction. Ah, fire. Fire, bro. I, this, this is why I love battle rap. I would say that Cyrus won the battle. Blink definitely took round one and would have took round two if Cyrus hadn't come back with, with something amazing. And it's crazy that they didn't do three rounds. I think it might have just been overkill. I don't know. Last song, Let It Shine. It's a pretty great outro, to be honest. I think it's definitely the biggest combination of gospel and uh, hip hop in this movie and R&B, you know, it's a, it's a great uh, little outro, you know, it's like just like a remix of a classic gospel song and yeah, all's well that ends well. Great music. It's been a long road, but we're finally here. This was so much fun to go back and watch. Let It Shine was one of those movies that just stuck with me, and I was never sure why, but I always found myself going back to it. It kind of became like a comfort movie for me. Like there's nothing like this on Disney Channel. The characters are fun, the music is great, and though the story is simple and kind of cliche, it was still compelling and entertaining. Damn shame we never got that sequel. All right, all jokes aside, do I really think this is Disney Channel's magnum opus? Fuck no, baby! <laughs> but do I believe this is one of the best DCOMs ever made? Yes. Yes, I do. You know, past the characters, past the music, past the filmmaking, the thing that will always bring me back to why I love this movie is how much it relates to me, in my youth especially. I was the kid who discovered his love for rapping in middle school. I remember hiding it from my parents for a minute and really wasn't sure why, but I realized that it was because my dad was a preacher and how he might not approve of what I was doing. We definitely had those arguments about how certain songs I was on would reflect on him as an elder in our church. I had that like church boy stigma hanging over my head that I was embarrassed of. Even around like my music friends and different people in the music community in my city, it was always known, hey, you genius as a Christian rapper. And it, it, it was like, it held me back. And it just kind of, even though I knew I was great, I knew that there was like a, a wall, a threshold that I had to push past and it was always tough to get past that to the audience. I had a best friend who had the rapper look and appeal that I just didn't. Growing up in the church, it was hard not to feel like boxed in. It's like the most frustrating thing when you first bring out your gift or talent that you've discovered, especially as a kid. And the first thing you're expected to do is to use it to contribute to the ministry, which isn't bad. But, you know, your first instinct is to want to spread your wings and expand and make it as big as possible and just go crazy. But you have people being like, oh, use it for the church, rap during praise and worship or, you know, stuff like that. It was it was very and people telling you what you shouldn't shouldn't make. It's like I'm still trying to figure this out. You have people who know nothing about what you're doing, trying to tell you how to do it just because they know a lot about God. <laughs> but they don't know a lot about God in the context of music. And I mean, that's a whole discussion in and of itself, but it hurts, you know? Especially when it's coming from your family. When there's pushback against that, it really hurts. And I experienced that. And so watching Cyrus go through it was, I mean, I don't even think I knew it at the time, but it was like a, a switch went off in my mind. And it said, no, you can do things the way you know you know how to do them, not the way that you think you should do them. I remember my first mixtape, I remember making it with the intention of impressing the elders in my church, impressing the older people in my church, which is such a weird mindset to go into it with, but that's really what I thought. Like I thought I was gonna win them over when this whole time I didn't need to win them over. I just needed to do it the way I knew God gave it to me. And that's kind of where I am now. And I don't think I'd be there without Let It Shine. But you don't have to take my word for it. What's going on you guys tim here or as i'm also known eugenius i am a rapper i am an artist myself if you want to check out some of my music look up eugenius on all platforms i just put out a couple songs for my church's play put them on streaming platforms for all to enjoy let me know what you think hope you enjoy what you hear thanks so much for listening thanks so much for watching much love